Good afternoon, and uh, thank you to the organizers for this opportunity. It's uh, really you know, a wonderful place to be. So I'm going to tell you about Liquid O, an opaque detector. So I'll start by explaining the concept of how we take an opaque scintillator and combine that with a, a lattice of fiber optic cables. And I'll show you how that gives us high resolution imaging capabilities and so really great particle identification or PID. Then I'll also tell you about our first papers, uh, the, the no wash scintillator, the opaque scintillator that's been developed for this. I'll show you the, uh, the proof of principle experiment we've done. And then the last section of my talk, I'll go through some of the physics that, that we, uh, we anticipate being able to do with this, uh, this detector. So when you think of a scintillator, you probably think of uh, a transparent material. And you know, there have been many transparent scintillator detectors. It's really been a workhorse of neutrino physics uh, from uh, you know, the discovery of the neutrino uh, to me beautiful measurements of solar neutrinos, um, the reactor experiments discovering theta-1-3, um, this is a nova scintillator cell, and we've made the first measurement of electron antineutrino appearance. And this is, this is the snow detector, which is about to be filled with, or is currently being filled with, uh, liquid scintillator. So why make a detector opaque? And this is the, the liquid O concept. So there's two ways you can make something opaque. You can have a short scattering length or you can have a short absorption length. And so what we want in liquid O is something sort of a milky type material, something with a short scattering length. What we don't want, or you know, we can ha tolerate a sort of moderate absorption length where you have a, you know, a dark, dark material. So what we want is a short scattering length. Because what that gives us is it gives us stochastic confinement of the light. So in a scintillator with a short scattering length, the light bounces around, does a random walk about where the point where it was produced. And so these, these diagrams illustrate this. This is the opaque case where the light is bouncing around, doing its random walk. And then in the transparent case, the light is just streaming away from where it was produced. And so the question is, how do we measure this light? Because it's trapped, it stays where it's produced, so how do we get it? We use a lattice of wavelength shifting fibers. This shows a simple geometry with fibers in two different directions, so you, um, you know, it gives you position information. And so these green lines just represent the, the random walk, a simulated random walk of, of the photons. So the photons, they bounce around, until they get absorbed by a fiber, and then they get re-emitted uh, isotropically, and the photons that are going along the length of the fiber, they then run along, and you can read them out. This is another illustration, um, this time looking sort of end-on, so what you, each one of these dots is the end of a fiber, and so you can consider two energy depositions, so the light you know, bounced around near where it's produced, and then those fibers are the ones that collect the light. And so what this technique does is it gives you the potential for high resolution imaging. And it gives you that without the need to manually segment. So you know, in many experiments like MINOS or NOVA, we had uh, sort of manually segmented strips in MINOS, for example, where we had a transparent scintillator surrounded by titanium dioxide to keep the light you know, in the strip. And you know, experiments like solid, you have cubes of, uh, of scintillator that are wrapped in order to keep the light in there. But here, you've got, it, it, when you have an opaque scintillator with a short scattering length, you get, you get, uh, get self-segmentation. You don't need to manually segment. Here's a simple example detector. It's a one centimeter pitch lattice of fibers running along a single direction, so they're all running uh, vertically. All these green lines, those are the fibers. 
And then the orange dot, that represents a 1 MeV positron. So that, that positron, you know, only travels about a millimeter before it loses its energy. Uh, then it annihilates and you get the two back-to-back -back gammas, which Compton scatter. Um, and each point represents, you know, a Compton electron. And so you've got this spatial pattern of, of energy depositions. So then the, if you project that onto a plane, you get a pattern that looks like that. So here's a simulation of what a liquid O detector would see. Um, each pixel here is the end of a fiber. And the color represents the, the, number, of, the number of photons hitting a fiber, being absorbed by a fiber. And so, you know, when the scintillator, so this is the opaque case on the left, and on the right is, the trans, is when we simulate the same detector, but with a transparent scintillator. And so, you know, you can clearly see that the pattern is preserved in the opaque case, but in the transparent case, the light is just streaming away from where it was produced, and so it gets washed out. Here are three examples. So here you've got a positron like what you just saw. Here's what an electron would look like, and then here's a gamma. All these are 2 MeV. And so you can clearly see that point-like energy depositions are going to be quite distinct from, uh, you know, gammas where you've got Comp Compton scatters. So this gives you the ability to distinguish positrons or gammas from point-like energy depositions, electrons, protons, and alphas. Here are two more examples, higher energy now. So here's a 50 MeV electron. Energy loss in an organic scintillator is about 2 MeV per centimeter. And so you end up with a, with a track-like pattern. This shows a 1 GeV muon just going straight through the detector. You can even see some sort of delta ray um, you know, where an electron got higher than average energy along the track. So what might a 2 GV electron um, antineutrino look like? So here, this is the positron. So at, two, you know, at this, these energies, the positron is producing an electromagnetic shower. And so that's what you see here. Uh, this is a pi minus. And then there's a decay at the end. And then organic scintillators are great for scattering neutrons as well. So this is a high-energy neutron that came off and hit a proton. Then you see the energy of that proton. So these are our first. Well, this, this, is, this, this paper here, this goes through the, the concept and some of the physics we think we could do with this type of detector. And then this paper uh, goes through the, you know, the characterization of this novel um, opaque scintillator. So the links are there. If you'd like to see more, uh, there's a seminar that was given at CERN, uh, and you can uh, find out more at that link. So what is this, uh, this scintillator mixture? So it's been given the name No Wash, which stands for New Opaque Wax Scintillator Heidelberg. It's developed in Heidelberg. And so what it is, is it's linear alkyl benzene plus PPO. And this is quite a standard scintillator. Uh, is used in Diabay and um, Snow Plus is, is filling its detector with LAB as well. And so what the, uh, what the Heidelberg group did was they, they took this LAB, well-known scintillator, and then they added paraffin to it at various concentrations. So this shows 10% paraffin, 15, and 20. And so what you see is the opacity depends on the paraffin concentration. And, but it, it also changes the temperature at which the crystallization occurs. So, it's, so this shows, it, so it, 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 this was kind of partly done in jest, but this is uh, the, the scintillator sample. Someone put a candle wick in it to sort of emphasize the point that the, the behavior is very similar to, to candle wax. So you have a transparent liquid when it's warm, and then it becomes an opaque solid when you cool it down. 
And so this really opened up you know, a neat way to make a detector. So you could set up a lattice of fibers, you could pour in your warm liquid, you could cool it down, and then you would end up with a, a solid, you know, robust detector, um, which is not going to leak. Here's a microscope image of what the wax looks like. So it's all these, all these microcrystals, and so the, the light is bouncing around inside, inside this wax. So moving on now to tell you about the proof of principle experiment that we've done. This is a, a little tiny test detector. It's about this sort of size. Um, we called this micro liquido. And so what it consisted of was three fibers, the bottom, the middle, and the top fiber. And then looking down at the top of this cylinder uh, was a PMT. The bottom of the detector was a very thin mylar sheet. And then we fired one MeV monoenergetic electrons through this mylar sheet. And so you had about a one millimeter point light um, energy deposition giving you a point light source at the bottom of the detector. Uh, this picture here is just looking down. There's a single fiber there uh, reflected in the mylar. And then this is what the detector looked like uh, from the outside. So what did we do? We added three different scintillators to this proof of principle, this little small detector. Um, we had a transparent scintillator, which shown in red. Then we had a high opacity in dark blue and a low opacity in light blue. And so these bar charts represent the bottom fiber, the middle fiber, top fiber, and then the PMT over here on the right. And so these, these four plots have been normalized so that the transparent case, which was just LAB, um, they've been normalized to, to be the same height. And so the predicted and yet remarkable feature is that with the high opacity scintillator, you actually collect more light at the bottom fiber. So the light is produced down here. And so when, when the scintillator is opaque, it can't stream away. And so it gets trapped. So you actually collect more light because it stayed where it was. This is the next step. This is what we're calling the, the mini liquido. Uh, you can see the design of it here. Uh, this is the real thing. Uh, you can see there's a few hundred fibers in here. Uh, you can see the ends of the fibers in that picture. And so data taking is really imminent with this. We're hoping to have results in the next few months. Now, moving on to the last section of my talk, what physics could we do with this type of detector? So you know, there are a lot of ideas. And unfortunately, I don't have time to cover them all. Some, um, so I've got some links here, which you can follow if you'd like more information on, on particular topics. Uh, one, one idea is uh, to make an ultra-precise D213 measurement. This would be useful in the future for tests of unitarity. And there, you'd really be exploiting the ability to reject backgrounds by using the positron identification. Uh, there's a neat idea to, uh, to try and measure potassium-40 in the Earth with geoneutrinos. The ability to separate electrons and positrons is, would be very important for uh, looking for CP violation um, using a pion decay at rest beam. So people have been thinking about that. The thing I'll focus on more here is doing CP violation search uh, using a, a pion decay in flight beam, so something like Dune or uh, Hyper-K. And then there, there are some more topics as well, which I'll, I'll talk about. So back in November, there was a workshop at Brookhaven, um, and it was called The Module of Opportunity for Dune. There is a Dune talk uh, later in the conference given by Ernesto, and, but I'll just very quickly introduce the, the uh, fire detector to you in case you don't know. So what we're planning to do at Dune is to build these huge underground caverns deep in South Dakota, 145 meters long, and so it'll be two of them, and then there'll be two 10 kiloton detectors per, per cavern, giving four 
detectors in total. The plan is to have two single phase liquid argon time projection chambers and one dual phase liquid argon TPC. But the fourth detector is still a, an open question. And so we can consider having a, a scintillator detector uh, taking up one of these uh, four, four spots. So is it realistic to think about scaling uh, such a detector up to that size? I think NOVA uh, has given us invaluable experience in this. Uh, this is a picture of NOVA's 14-kiloton uh, detector. And so use these long 15-meter-long cells with a fiber looped around inside. Now, interestingly, NOVA um, has about a 12% efficiency for the light that's produced to, be, to hit and be absorbed by the fiber. So the light bounces around inside the scintillator cell and has about a 12% chance of being, being captured. But from our simulations with Liquido, simulating a few millimeter scattering length, we think that it could be much higher in, in an opaque scintillator. The rough cost is expected to be sort of comparable to this detector, which cost about $120 million. Some advantages with respect to liquid argon TPCs are that you could operate this detector at room temperature. You don't need the cryostat, which costs about $70 million per, per module. And the scintillator you know, has other advantages. It's good at uh, self-shielding and things like that, but against neutrons particularly. And so, you know, what I think these images kind of tell the story that, you know, this is a muon neutrino charge current event. Uh, you've got a long muon track here. You can see the decay at the end. Uh, this is a pion decaying to a muon. And, and you know, there's, there's a lot of information. Here's a neutral current event. You have a kaon in there, decayed. Um, anyway, you can see lots of information. Another... Um, electron antineutrino charge current event, you have the electron shower, you have the neutron and a proton down here, and so on. So here's just sort of trying to digest a bit more what's going on. So with the kind of light levels that we, we think we could get, you'd be talking about getting about 100,000 photoelectrons per GeV. So you'd have very you know, good calorimetry. Um, one of the advantages of scintillator um, over liquid argon is that the radiation length is about three times longer. So it's about 14 centimeters for liquid argon, but it's about half a meter for, for uh, an organic scintillator. And so that, that allows the events to spread out, and that's important because one of the backgrounds is pi zeros, where you mistake the gamma electromagnetic shower for an electron or positron electromagnetic shower. Scintillators are fast, and so that could be advantageous for detecting neutrons, or they're also very good at making neutrons scatter and lose their energy, um, but you could potentially do neutron time of flight for tens of MeV um, neutrons if you had you know, fast readout. Um, there's also you know, the, the potential to identify the charge sign at the end of muon tracks from the, the positron ID. Um, and so I, I hope what you can take away from this is that the imaging capabilities of this type of detector should be comparable to a liquid argon TPC, but have some complementary features as well. So what about other things that you could do with a huge uh, you know, 10 kiloton detector? Um, you know, the scintillator would be, you know, provide a really excellent uh, set of interactions if should we be lucky enough to get a supernova. Uh, you'd have a very low energy threshold. Uh, you'd have the interactions on carbon, which are not available, obviously, in the liquid argon detectors. Um, you could potentially do charge sign ID, uh, directionality, and so on. This type of detector would also be great for doing uh, nucleon decay. You'd have access to a lot of the exclusive final states. And then you know, this, shows, this shows a k-on decaying to a muon decaying to you know, a, a positron. 
Other, other things, you know, you'd be sensitive to GM neutrinos and reactor anti neutrinos as well, assuming that you could get your energy threshold low enough, which is, is quite likely. So another thing to think about for the physics is that um, is doping or loading your scintillator with, with other materials. So dope scintillators have been used with great success. Uh, the reactor C213 experiments, they were doped with gadolinium to enhance neutron capture. Uh, Kamlan Zen was doped with xenon. Now, often one of the challenges to go to higher loadings is that you end up making the, the scintillator opaque. And so, you know, that's, but, you know, here that's what we want. And so, you know, it, because you need opacity for liquid O, you know, you're removing the, that transparency requirement. And so I think what this means is that there could be a whole new landscape of novel materials and mixtures to think about in producing a scintillator. And it's it, this new way of thinking, which is quite counterintuitive, um, you know, I think is, is an opportunity. So I hope I've managed to introduce the uh, concept of liquid O to you. It's an, an opaque scintillator coupled or combined with a, a lattice of fibers. And, and I think a point to emphasize is that you know, a lot of this is based on established technology of using fibers and scintillators and the associated readout. You know, it's been done at scale um, in, in, in many experiments. Liquid O brings new physics opportunities. I think the, the combination of these factors, with the high resolution imaging and particle identification, the low energy threshold of a scintillator, and the potential for high levels of doping should lead to you know, new, new ways to make measurements of neutrinos and, and beyond. The R&D is progressing rapidly and steadily. We've done the proof of principle experiment, and the larger detector data is, is imminent now. Liquid O is a whole new way of thinking about a scintillator detector. We've only just scratched the surface, and so I'm, I'm excited about what we can do with this in, in the next few years. So thank you for your attention. Oh, thank, thank you, Jeff.